Welcome to Philosophy of Value Workshops number 44 of series 5. Uh, the question this evening is, are the four states of cognition, affect, will and value exhaustively comprehensive? A reading again uh, from one of my works, The Pursuit of Value, the um, introduction. So these workshops have focused on the two themes of consciousness and value. And in order to explicate these, I have subdivided them into four further mental states. So I'm asking whether the four states of cognition, affect, will and value are exhaustively comprehensive. We have previously defined mind or consciousness in several other different ways. Firstly, not to be forgotten, is the first person experience that we have as conscious beings. Then, the general concept of mind can be distinguished from consciousness as all the states that I am conscious of. Different theories like dualism and physicalism also offer different views which informs one's own view or conception of consciousness. And phenomenology looks to structures of consciousness like intentionality and unity or div divisibility. For myself, I hold an interactionist account of mind and a structural conception of consciousness as a process or as a relation. Briefly, this means, this means that the origins and development of mind is explicable in terms of um, you know, um, interactions with the world. And that the properties of consciousness can be best explained as structures like intentionality and divisibility. And also that consciousness isn't an object but a process and relation moving through time and space. Analytic philosophy classifies mind and mental states as either cognitive or non-cognitive. But this classification expresses a cognitivist bias and defines non-cognitive states ne negatively. So I supplement this classification with the four categories of cognition, affect, will and value. C cognitive states are those like belief, reason and knowledge which necessarily entail mental objects. Affect states, as above, are feelings like pleasure and fear and are constituted by their own experience. The will is a mental impulse to act which draws upon cognition, affect and value. And value is a mental state with features like quality, preference and tension. I explain the function and significance of these four states elsewhere and in other workshops. Yet I further explicate them below in arguing for their comprehensiveness and comparable, uh, comparable classifications can be found in both the social sciences and in the work of thinkers like Sartre. We can make a comparison with Sartre's constitution of the ego he describes as actions, states and qualities. With respect to affect, Sartre explains his states are affect states like hate, love and jealousy. But we may wonder how he can um, incorporate what is physical action into a constitution of the ego. Yet action need not always, need not always be physical as in the cases of mental acts and speech acts. And the force of intent required to motivate an action can be described as the will. So we will make use of this later to provide a close a comparison between action and will. 
with respect to a comparison between Sartre's qualities and what we call values, Sartre writes, the qualities of the ego represent the ensemble of virtues, you know, latent traits, potentialities, which constitute our character and our habits, which I think is a reasonable description of values. Sartre doesn't refer to cognition as what we can call a passive state or as something um, in itself, but he uses its active form as recognition 67 times in his work Being and Nothingness. So we are considering whether the four states of cognition, affect, will and value are exhaustively comprehensive. Yet we are doing this in view of their potential as human objectives. So also for this reason we should consider the general category of consciousness itself. But the general character of consciousness seems to prevent any specific property being named as an objective. This is because consciousness can be characterized as a multiplicity of states rather than a single entity. And if we did single out a specific property, then that property would be the objective. A couple of candidate properties are personal identity and intrinsic value. But value is already a candidate objective and the intrinsic value of consciousness is questionable and personal identity is an anachronistic objective that we will discuss shortly. And if the property is the potential of consciousness for development, then that appears to be a quantification of consciousness rather than a specific property. But the problem for consciousness as a human objective, which should bring solutions, is that it's problematic. That is, its increase incurs problems like anxiety, <clears throat> anomie, alienation, fr fragmentation and guilt. So we are returned to considering cognition, affect, will and value as properties of consciousness. The consideration of these states as properties of consciousness also bears upon their comprehensiveness. This is because we want to know how they are part of the amalgam of consciousness. In the case of cognition, cognition consists of states like belief, perception and knowledge. As indicated above, in analytic and existential philosophy, cognition is taken as an aspect of consciousness by default. This is explained by the shared belief that consciousness is conscious of something. Reflective consciousness can also be explained as knowing that one is conscious. These explanations indicate the close <clears throat> identification of cognition with consciousness. The place of cognition in a typology of mind is also secured by its significance in the cognitive-non-cognitive -cognitive debate. Issues here are about cognition or non-cognitive um, ex explanations of um, activities like morals, motivation and meaning. The point is that analytic philosophy is using these as, uh, as uh, exhaustively co comprehensive states. But as non-cognitive states include all non-cognitive states, this isn't a detailed cl classification. In this debate, analytic philosophy usually has a preference for cognitive explanations. Cognitivists usually hold that cognitive explanations are that non-cognitive ex, um, explanations are blind and can't guide action. Non-cognitivists hold that cognitive explanations are impotent and can't motivate behaviour. 
On this view, non-cognitivist explanations are broadly defined in terms of feelings like happiness and values. But I distinguish values from feelings like happiness that I, like others, describe as affect states. Hence, I have broadened the classification to include <clears throat> affect states and values as well as co cognition. Affect states can be said to include all feelings such as happiness, pain and pleasure. And these states are extensively discussed in the context of utilitarianism. I won't dispute utilitarianism here, but examining its claims provides understanding of happiness and affect. Yet I have several crit criticisms of happiness as either a human or ethical objective. My main criticism is that happiness is blind. It doesn't offer the why or how of life. It's very nice to be happy, of course, but reflective human co consciousness requires more. Human co consciousness entails purpose and value that happiness doesn't provide. And my central criticism of happiness as a value, or as an intrinsic value, is that it need not always be of value. I could regard happiness as encouraging weakness, as a misguided objective, for forbidden by God, all kinds of things. And if happiness need not always be of value, it couldn't have intrinsic value. This is an argument, if one, is, if one is needed, for other states in addition to affect states like happiness. That is, in addition to cognition and affect states, we also require values and value states. We can give some examples of value like desire, wanting, love, hate, morals, um, aesthetics and bias. Yet these examples <clears throat> illustrate a known problem of the diversity of values outlined shortly. That is, many different states may be ma masquerading as one concept. Elsewhere, I present a unified concept of value with features like subject, subjectivity, preference and quality. Yet in the absence of that account, we can define value functionally and, and um, ostensively. Some functional and ostensive de definitions of value can also indicate the significance of value at the same time. For example, in religion, God represents the believer's highest value. Love is a mode of value with different kinds of love presenting different kinds of value. And politics is described by David Easton as the um, authoritative um, allocation of values. I argue that value is central to such key aspects of human life as well as to my own philosophy of life. And it's also been well um, argued that value can be found in every human activity. This doesn't mean that activities are valuable, but they are value laden. More specifically, I can offer a classification of different values. This is of the three types of values of perspectival, motivational and experiential values. Firstly, perspectival values of value-laden science, bias, and numerical and truth values of true or false. The idea of perspectival values is widely used by thinkers such as Williams and Nagel. Secondly, m motivational and moral values are of ethical principles and reasons for action. Moral values are, used, are universally re recognised as a particular kind of value. And thirdly, experiential values or affective values are those like love, hate, de desire, guilt, shame, pride, d 
disgust and pity. So affective values aren't usually you know, are described as such, but are often you know, are described as such in, um, in a technical terms. The problem again is whether all these states can be properly described as values. Perspectival values don't even seem to have subjective experiential content. Numerical and truth values seem to be values analogously, better described as quantifications. Yet I believe they can be unified with properties like subjectivity, preference and quality. But a counter argument is that value doesn't exist and only exists as a construct or collective of various values. Margaret Thatcher made a similar claim that society doesn't exist, that is, only people and workers exist, or more relevantly, that consciousness doesn't exist, as Daniel Dennett implies. The view is that only disparate mental states exist, but not consciousness as an entity. We can't argue this here, but consciousness could have a unity around personal identity, time and space. And human consciousness is also a self-consciousness that can centre itself with the statement, I am. So I would also argue against the view that value doesn't exist because it's only a collective concept. Its collectivity doesn't di diminish its significance as a collection of mental states that we call value. So this brief discussion indicates that values are ubiquitous in human life and thereby are a required ca category. But the concept of value is ne nevertheless um, incohate, in need of states like co cognition, to complement it. Another possible problem is that there are no pure states of value which might um, invalidate the classification. For example, the social scientist Tristram um, Engelhardt holds that knowledge is always value laden. Anthony, Anthony Grayling described the world as being saturated with values. And Hilary Putnam put it in terms of the breakdown of the fact-value dichotomy. But this, con but this concatenation of states is a only a problem for a notion of pure, um, isolated and inviolable mental states. For example, Richard Rorty holds that cognitive and non-cognitive states are, I quote, don't seem to have anything in common except a refusal to call them f physical. But on the view I advance here, there are no pure states and they all inter interpe interpenetrate with each other. But there is another similar problem for what we have called motivational or moral values. We may v value things but not act to um, achieve them because of weakness or conflicts of value. The extra ingredient required to motivate action is described as the will, as we noted um, earlier. The will can be described as a fundamental aspect of mind for the following reasons. Because of its noted earlier mo our motivational function, its relations with value and its constitutional function. The relations of the will to value can be, dif can be differentiated into its various aspects of value. So wanting is a directional ca capacity of the will that implies value. Choice is a selective capacity of the will that also implies value. And loving and hating are positive and negative um, affective capacities of the will that further imply that value. Yet the will is construed as an objective in certain, to, in certain Teutonic thinking in Schopenhauer and in Nietzsche. Now the will is constitutive of value but as a means to an end it is idiosyncratic as a human objective. 
the will isn't a state that can be pursued, it's a relation or process towards an end. This this, the will implies value, but is neither a value in itself or an intrinsic value. This discussion above indicates the need for a classification in terms of cognition, affect, will and value. Yet the cognitive non-cognitive uh, distinction was also found to be co complete but lacking in specificity. Can we say the same thing of the classification of cognition, affect, will and value? We need to consider you know, our alternatives to these four states to test their comprehensiveness. We could first consider unconscious mental events as a possible exception to this classification. They don't seem to be classifi uh, cl uh, classifiable as any of the states of cognition, affect, will and value. But many, like, like, like Sartre, insist that unconscious events aren't mental events because they are un unconscious. Yet we might accept the unconscious as an aspect of mind, but not of consciousness. This would preserve the uh, integrity of these four states as constituting co consciousness. But as another possible exception, can abstractions like truth or mathematics be part of this classification? They might be regarded as cognitive representations of anthropocentric constructions, but the universality defies their straightforward classification as aspects of consciousness. Yet on a standard objectivist view, truth and, mathem and mathematics could be considered as properties of the world, or on a pluralist ontology, they could be considered as parts of another mode of existence. And like physical objects, abstractions could then be um, apprehended through cognition. So like abstractions, very few people regard physical objects as mental states. So again, abstractions need, do not seem to be exceptions to the proposed classification. A third possible exception is personal identity especially of the kind proposed by Barry Dainton. Dainton makes a distinction between the phenomenal self and the psychological self. He does this with the idea of teleportation, where people are changed into data and teleported somewhere else. They are reconstructed exactly as before, down to every neuron and memory. They believe themselves to be the same person as before, that is, their psychological self. But the question is, are they the same person? They think they are the same person because they have the memories of the same person. But Dainton considers the view that teleportation is a form of suicide. This is because the phenomenal self would not have the same phenomenal um, identity as the previous person. This thought experiment distinguishes the phenomenal self from the psychological self. But the phenomenal self is an aspect of consciousness that excludes psych psychological aspects of personal <clears throat> identity. That is, m memories, um, incognition or affect states, um, inclinations of will and values. But as a primary aspect of the general condition of consciousness, I can accept the personal identity of the phenomenal self as an exception. Postmodernists <clears throat> post pose a very different objection to such classifications as cognition, affect, will and value. That is, even using such terms restricts us to a modular or a classificatory way of thinking. That this is because such cl classifications are oversimplifications of discourse which cannot have such boundaries. This postmodernist critique is an extension as well as a criticism of the structuralism of people like Saussure and Levi Strauss. 
De Derrida claims that meanings are both historical and structural relating to immediate meanings in language. In his ob obscurantist style, De Derrida refers to di diachronic and synchronic kinds of signs or meanings. For Derrida, this means that meanings really refer to all other re references which are absent. But this cannot be done, so the full meaning of, of um, anything can't be fully mm, articulated. So the postmodernist critique is of any form of universalization, pri privileged meanings, or classifications. I'm skeptical whether the postmodern theory of meaning or non-meaning takes us further than standard critiques of language and Wittgenstein's complex theory of meaning. That is, the conclusion that there are no fixed, <coughs> absolute or definitive meanings. Leaving us with the idea that the mountain has brought forth a mouse. My response is to agree that the classification of cognition, affect and will and value isn't complete or absolute and that authentic philosophical discussion can only be conducted in ambiguity and vagueness. But that without the categories of consciousness, cognition, affect, will and value, discussion of human experience would be directionless empty and incoherent. In conclusion, I can, I can reiterate two uh, um, origins of the classification of cognition, affect, will and value. These were the limitations of the cognitive, non-cognitive you know, uh, distinction in analytic philosophy and a comparison with Sartre's constitution of the ego as action, states and qualities. I then considered consciousness as an inclusive category, yet unsuitable itself as a human objective. C cognition was presented as a primary c category because c consciousness is conscious of something, yet affect will and value were needed to explain human experience co comprehensively. Yet value was privileged over affect and will because only value is able to provide meaning, purpose and the why of life. This is even though the concept of values faces problems of diversification and coherence. We then considered possible exceptions to the proposed classification. These took the forms of unconscious mental states, mathematical <coughs> abstractions and personal <coughs> identity. And I conceded that personal identity as phenomenal co consciousness may well be an exception. Yet postmodern critiques of such classifications were seen to be largely va vacuous and the concepts of cognition, affect, will and value appear to remain as the building blocks for understanding human existence and consciousness. So let me have your comments and criticisms on websites like meetup.com, philosophy of value workshops.